Hello and welcome to the Daily Space and Learning Space for today, October 18th, 2018. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I am here to put science in your brain. Uh, today we're going to do an abbreviated roundup of the news and then I'm going to bring on special guest Jose Salgald. Sorry, let me say that again. Special guest Jose Salgado, who is going to talk to us about the amazing work he does bringing together astronomical imagery and music and getting you to be able to understand our universe in the most beautiful, literally the most beautiful way possible. Um, so welcome everyone for our abbreviated news. I'm just going to do a rundown of top stories. Um, most important of all, tomorrow evening, if all goes well, at 1025 Eastern, 725 uh, Pacific, the rest of you can do math, uh, the Beppo Colombo satellite system is going to be working to launch from French New Guinea. This particular pair of missions are going to ride together, uh, locked together all the way to Mercury, where a European Space Agency built and a Japanese JAXA built uh, satellite are going to separate and then work to study the closest planet to the sun in unprecedented detail with high resolution images and with magnetic field mapping. And this will allow us to understand that area close to the sun better than we can right now. Um, we're going to have to wait for it to get to Mercury, but the waiting to see it launch is almost over, and we will be bringing that all to you live here at CosmoQuest. So tune in about 30 minutes prior to launch. Watch us on Twitter. We will be keeping you updated with any changes that occur to the launch schedule. Now, in addition to a reminder that Beppo Columba is going to go up, um, I just wanted to give you some highlights and I will be doing extended news tomorrow going in depth on these and all the rest of the news that happens. Um, so it, it's it's been 10 years since the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory uh, made its way into outer space. And after all of these years, the mission can now announce that they have systematically observed a blazar. This is an active galaxy that has a feeding black hole in the center. And as they've been doing this, they've been able to discover that the blazar PG1553 plus 113 actually has a two-year period in its gamma ray brightness. Uh, this indicates that there's periodic physics going on. Uh, this is a completely new result. We've never seen this before. And I look forward to seeing how they explain all the new observations that we're making. And what's cool is this is something that is well-timed for the construction of the square kilometer array with that new radio array that is being built in both Australia and the southern uh, part of the African continent. Um, we're going to be able to follow up with this and really, well, in the radio, dig down and see what physics is going on. Uh, we also have news from Chandra of being able to use the youngest pulsar ever, dis ever discovered to be able to trace out exactly how it is that massive stars die and leave behind this stellar remnant of high density material. Um, for those of you who don't know just how dense a neutron star is, take an object bigger than the sun and condense it down to roughly the diameter of Manhattan Island. These are tiny, dense objects that spin, in some cases, thousands of times a second. Uh, so we'll go into more detail on that. And our final highlight is uh, collective observations made by astronomers all around the world of the comet, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, I apologize, the comet uh, Shawasman Vakman 1, 29P, uh, have discovered that this particular comet has a truly strange composition. It appears to have uh, magne magnesium rich silicate particles with a bit of iron uh, 
basically enriching this object in a way that we just haven't quite seen before. Um, so this is kind of amazing. The, the dust of this object is pretty much one thing and it's one weird thing. Um, so as we talked about yesterday, this is now going to be one of those cases of new observations confining our theories for how these kinds of objects form and evolve over time. Now we have no one more weirdo that our theories have to explain as the universe once again proves far more creative than our human mind usually starts out as being. So, so that's a quick rundown of today's highlights. Uh, as I said, I will be coming back and bringing you these stories in more detail tomorrow. But I'd now like to switch over and bring on screen Dr. Jose Salgado, uh, who comes to us from KV265, the sci science through art. Um, welcome, Jose. It's wonderful to have you on our show. Likewise, thanks so much for the invitation. So you and I, I think, met for the first time in Cape Town for the 2010 Communicating Astronomy to the Public meeting. And, and if I remember correctly, you were out there taking stereo images out at the observatory. Um, and, and that, I feel like, was just the start of the beautiful things you're working on today. Can, can you give our audience an understanding of, of where you started and what it is that you're now doing? And I'm, go ahead. Absolutely. Well, obviously, you know, you and I and, and many of our colleagues have something in common, which is we're passionate about science communication. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's why, you know, but that's why we do what we do. But in my case, I specialize on using the arts, the visual arts, as well as music to engage people and get them uh, interested in science. So uh, let me tell you about the, 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 you know, the, the humble origins. I was teaching astronomy to working adults uh, um, more than 10 years ago. So people who had full-time jobs and then they would take an astronomy class at night for four hours, oh, six wow. to 10 p.m. And you can imagine, you know, they were all kind of like, you know, tired yeah. after working all, all day long. And I started uh, showing my photography of the night sky, of the observatories that I was um, uh, visiting. And I noticed that when you show people something, you know, uh, photos from a place that you visited, uh, from an experience that you went through, you're basically moving degrees of separation. And it's not something you downloaded from the internet, but it's like, oh, wait a second, you were there? Yeah. And it could have been images from Mauna Kea, for example, you know, beautiful night sky from Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So then I would get people's attention. And I'm like, oh, well, this is, this is interesting. When I show something that it's from experience, I get... I get people more engaged. Then the other thing that that happened more or less at the same time that was that the Chicago Sinfonietta, one of the major symphonies in the city of Chicago, um, asked me to make a film. Well, actually, they didn't say use the word film. They said, could you produce a visual backdrop that we can project while we play the planets by Gustav Holst? You know, that beautiful yeah. composition that it's already 100 years old. So I said, oh, yeah, this would be great. Uh, you know, I have been dealing a lot with photography, with scientific illustration, but now I can work and move to, you know, motion graphics and make a film that follows very closely what's happening uh, music-wise. So instead of showing something that it's just like a pretty slideshow that has no connection with the music, I said, I could make something that actually goes with the music. And as you well know, and, and all these you know, astronomy enthusiasts that follow you know, the images themselves suffice because they're very beautiful. But I think it would be a little bit of a distraction if you show something beautiful that has nothing to do with the music. Right. So what I did was make this film that followed the music. That was so successful that then out of that project, uh, we founded KV265, which is a nonprofit organization that uses all these, um, you know, media, like I said, the, the films, the photography, uh, the music compositions 
to bring um, science into places where traditionally you don't do science communication, for example, the concert hall. Yes. So imagine you, you come to the concert hall to listen to beautiful music, not necessarily to learn about science and the universe, but then people are exposed to these incredible visuals from NASA, my own photography and other sources, you know, sources from the European Southern Observatory, the European uh, Space Agency. And the idea is to inspire people to learn more about what they see on screen. And and I've brought up uh, your Flickr page on uh, music and and the night sky and currently have up on the screen a fabulous image where uh, it looks like the conductor is asking more of the brass while getting ready to cue something and there's this <laughs> amazing blazar uh, or other active galactic nuclei I can't tell image in oh, the background. Oh, that's right. And, yes, yes, yes. And just the dynamicism of how these two things are aligned is is fabulous now it's it's such an amazing honor to get to work with with an organization like the chicago philharmonic and and you took that and since then you've got to work with groups all over the United States. I don't know if you've worked outside of the United States um, in yes. both small and large towns. How how did you go about going from being asked, can you do this, to going, dear conductor, can I do this with you? Right. So so a couple of yeah, a couple of things happened. So like I said, I was I was asked, then I thought wait a second, this could be, you know, I, I could do something that would bring them together. And they had not, you know, while I was producing it for a, a long time, they had not seen, you know, the work. And at some point, you know, I think they're probably getting a little bit worried. It's like, well, can you show us what you have yeah. so far? And I said, yes. Uh, and then, of course, the music director, you know, was there, uh, 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 Paul Freeman, uh, rest in peace. And, and I said, well, just to give you a warning, right? I'm, I'm, I'm following the music. So now at the concert, you know, you need to follow the film to bring, you know, to synchronize both things. And when they, you know, saw what I had produced so far, because I was still working on the planets, they absolutely loved it. Um, a couple of things happened regarding the, uh, the, the, the popularization, if you will, of the films. Uh, first of all, you know, word of mouth, that symphony, the Chicago Symphony, I told other symphonies when they ask about, hey, does anybody know if there's a film out there to go with the planets? And, you know, there, there are a few. So they started recommending mine. But as you, you know, uh, as you recall, 2009 was a big year, right? Yeah. The International Year of Astronomy. So we had a meeting, I think it was in 08 in, in, in Athens, where people were right um, uh, talking about what they were going to do. All these astronomical institutions talked about what they were going to do during 09. So I presented uh, two of the movements. I presented Mars and Jupiter. People loved what they saw, and they started talking to me right there in Athens, saying like, hey, so let us talk to the, our local you know, orchestra, because we want to bring the films next year. So 09 was a big year. I think it was like 30 something concerts in that year alone. Uh, mini tour in, in, in Spain, in uh, Castilla-La Mancha, uh, Madrid, um, concert in Taiwan. Uh, so we had a couple of international concerts in Prague, as well, of course, you know, as you mentioned, the United States. So that was basically you know, the boom. And while producing the planets, I enjoyed the process so much that I said, like, yeah, I this is what I should be doing. So I started thinking about, you know, a second and a third production. So that was followed by a second film, Mussorgsky's uh, Pictures at an Exhibition. So that one is called The Universe at an Exhibition. Actually, the image that you were talking about with the uh, active galactic nu uh, uh, nucleus, that's actually from pictures at an exhibition that uses a lot of images from the Hubble Space Telescope. As you know, they're an incredible institution that puts out all these beautiful visuals, right? Not only the um, images themselves, but the scientific visualizations, right? All these animations that are science driven. And all of those things end up, you know, in the films to engage people. 
Now, I, I have up on the screen an image that I think is one of your Aurora photographs. It shows this amazing Y-shaped green Aurora in the background reflected off of a lake. Um, I, I'm being asked, um, how did you decide how to present the images and what setup was necessary? Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm, I was trying to uh, look at the uh, look at the uh, the image here on a, on a second monitor. Okay, so yeah, what what about the uh, the aurora and uh, reflected on the lake? I uh, so so how the the question that we're getting from Hanny's uh, Vorverp in the chat is, um, how did you decide how to present the images? What uh, what setup was necessary? So 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 they are they can be they can come that decision can come uh, uh, in any of two ways. Um, an orchestra might be interested in, in presenting a particular piece of music, and then I have to find uh, visuals that would match. And that was the case of Pictures at an Exhibition. Our second collaboration with Chicago Sinfonieta was Pictures at an Exhibition. I mean, that's something that they said, hey, we could do this and yeah. make a film for it. And I thought, hmm, wait a second pictures at an exhibition, how about if we present astronomical pictures at an exhibition? Instead of presenting the paintings that inspire Mussorgsky in the first place, um, these astronomical images look like paintings oftentimes, yeah. right? It's like nature is creating artwork, you know, for us. So I said, what if the angle is treating the astronomical images as, as artwork? So you see, so that's something that music came first and then I found visuals that would match it. Um, but in the case of, let's say the Northern Lights, Northern Lights are so beautiful, so awe-inspiring that it was a matter of like, okay, I know that I have to make a film about the Northern Lights, now, which music to 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 match it with and in the case of of our first work about the northern lights we actually commissioned the music from a uh, world-renowned american uh, composer chris theophanidis so we had the uh, the uh, the privilege of working with him and from the very start of the project and he actually composed the music to fit the film and it's actually a film based on uh, a work based on a children's story so it doesn't not only has film and music but it has narration as well so sometimes you know it's the music that comes first and then we find uh, matching visuals or we know that the visuals are so incredible that we have to make a film about that and then we'll find matching music or we commission the music and and what's kind of uh, amazing is so much of your stuff is out there that, well, I, I'd recommend if people can, they go to one of the shows. But um, I'm currently showing uh, on Venmo uh, your um, YKNF uh video that is time lapse of the aurora so people can go and they can explore your imagery on Flickr. they can see many of your videos up on venmo you're making all of this stuff available for people um how how did yeah. you make the decision to do that well there is um it's you know great it's another way of you know reaching out reaching out to people and inspire them to you know learn about the, the you know the science but of course another way to uh, to promote you know what what we do um so so yes yeah, so the Flickr, basically the Flickr account is a big repository of all these images that are shot um sometimes you know for for the films but the neat thing about the films is that it would be it would be sad if we only made them for the concert in the sense yeah. in in the sense that um they not only in, inspire people in the concert hall but they form the basis for the lectures that I give so we have x numbers of concerts uh per year, but then we have even more lectures, you know, public lectures uh, that, that we offer. So the lectures are very, um, not only visually rich, but they are also music, musically rich, because then I bring excerpts from the films and then I talk about how I combine, you know, science and art to make uh, the films, talk about the science uh, behind the films. And in case of when we visit schools, 
one of the messages that we bring is that, you know, people can be, you know, especially these young minds that are being shaped, they can be multidisciplinary individuals. That is, that they don't have to become one track minded individuals when, you know, uh, where they say, this is what I want to do in life, just this one thing, and I'm not going to do anything else. And it's just one discipline. But if you think about the Renaissance man, it was yeah. actually quite the opposite, right? It was bringing all these disciplines, one, you know, benefits from the other. Sometimes, you know, there's not, uh, there's, it's, it's a combination of things. You have these incredible, um, you know, photography, for example, photography can be used in imaging to do sign search, then you can create artwork. And some of these images, like I said, you know, they look like artwork uh, themselves. So not only are they meant to, to help us learn about the universe, but they help us get other people inspired to learn not only about the scientific aspects of our work, but also the artistic aspects. So, um, so yeah, so the images, you know, it, it's, I just I love, you know, photography. So I shoot because something is really uh, incredibly interesting. It could be the most extreme lunar tides in the Bay of Fundy in Canada. It could be volcanoes in Hawaii. It could be the night sky from Chile. And then we'll find a way to a, 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 a medium for us to use the images in. It could be in a film, could be in a lecture, could be on hey, on Flickr, reaching many, many people. Uh, you know, like you mentioned Vimeo as well with all these clips. So yeah, it's all about inspiring people to learn. So so here we have, I guess, a chicken and the egg question. Did did mm -hmm. you get interested in art when you started thinking about doing public outreach? Or were you already interested in photography and music and art and then got into the public outreach? Right. So the 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 formal um you know, path was always uh, science and then science education, because that's what I studied, right? Um, uh, I studied physics at the University of Puerto Rico, and then I studied astronomy at the University of Michigan. So the path was to become an astronomer. Yeah. But from an early age, I enjoyed, you know, the arts. I enjoyed music. I enjoyed photography. I think I got my first camera when I was in eighth grade. And what did I, you know, point at? first the sky so you know i would take my camera um to the roof of, of my house in puerto rico and then photograph you know the moon and sunrises so it was always you know interested in in, in the astronomical aspects um but yes yeah, so photography was like in, in the background and while in grad school you know in the in the 90s the buzzwords were epo right education and public outreach and I said, oh, wait a second, this is becoming, finally, people in the scientific community, actually, and we have we owe that a, a lot to NASA, that demanded that a percentage of the budget for a mission, for a project, was devoted to science communication, right? Uh, education and public outreach efforts. So I said, oh, wait a second. So this could be a career for me. I could actually combine both things, combine my passion for science and astronomy with my passion for you know education and then combine it with um photography i start got got interested in graphic design in the in the 90s so i started making illustrations there was this new thing called the world wide web right in the yep. 90s and everybody was making websites to what to communicate science right yes. so so it was like all these things converged in the 90s so I said, like, this is what I should be doing. But it wasn't until, like I said, my first film, uh, The Planets, it's mostly visuals from the space agencies and historical documents as well, NASA, ESA. But then for the second production, I included time-lapse sequences of Mauna Kea in pictures at an exhibition. So that was the first time probably that I used my photography really professionally you know to to uh f with a very defined objective with which was making this film to communicate science and from there on i said like oh now not only you know uh 
it's nice not to depend on these other agencies for visuals, but then I could shoot the photography that I need. So um, for the third production, which is about the moon, uh, one thing to cover in, in a film about the moon is the very powerful lunar tides, yes. right? So, uh, so as I mentioned, I, you know, we visited the Bay of Fundy in, in Nova Scotia to photograph tides dropping, you know, almost 50 feet in six hours. And yes. you can capture that in, in time-lapse sequences. So then from there on, it became the norm uh, to do the photography for the for the films, you know. So if I need something, why not just just shoot it? Now, of course, I'm doing a lot of drone photography because wow. you can do incredible things with drones, yes. right? Um, but always combine them with, you know, you leave NASA, you know, to do what they know best, which is get the you know the the incredible images of of the planets and galaxies and all these incredible objects. But then whatever I can do, you know, that it's you know ground based or from the air with a drone, I'm, I'm shooting myself, so. Now, with, with your time lapse, it's, it's often hard to tell, especially when we're looking at uh, things like your Aurora footage, it, it's difficult to tell just how much time is being compressed. I, I'm about to, to click over to your real-time Aurora uh, video, but before I do that, uh, how many nights got compressed in to your time-lapse Aurora movie? So I have, there's, there's this, the second production uh, using the Auroras is called the Aurora Triptych. Um, three movements composed by Canadian composer John Estacio. He was inspired by the sun and by the Northern Lights. So he uh, wrote this beautiful music. And as you know, there's a connection between the sun, the space weather it creates. And then as a result, we get the the, the auroras here on, on Earth. So it's a beautiful way of telling that story with music and visuals. Um, so, um, so the second movement is called Borealis. And basically it portrays or try, tries to portray what one incredible night of Baroque viewing might look like. So it goes from sunset, evening twilight, all the way to morning twilight. So what I did is I shot for about nine nights in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada, and then selected the best sequences and condensed that to, I think it's like nine minutes. Yeah. So it portrays one really incredible night, but it's actually, it was shot you know, over the, the, the time period of a, of a week. But yeah, you're right. The, one of the most common questions when people see the, the time-lapse sequences, like, okay, if it's time-lapse, beauty of time lapse is that it lets us compress something that takes a long time into a short amount of time and one beautiful example is that the night sky and the rotation of earth right so earth rotates so that means that the sky appears to rotate in the opposite direction so you see the milky way rising crossing the sky and so on of course that would take you know many hours you yeah. can compress that in seconds so in the case of the 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 auroras yes it's compressed but then I said, I should take real time video, not time lapse sequence, but with a video camera, take uh, footage of the Northern Lights. So more for educational purposes, you know, the quality since it's video and it's such short exposures, you're taking about 30 exposures in one second, as opposed to taking a few seconds to just produce one exposure. So the quality is not going to be the same, but that's fine. This is for for educational purposes, I want to show how fast they can move, and that's the clip that you you are about to uh, to to uh, yeah. To, so to I, show. I I'm actually showing it over You're and over. Right yeah, right. And so, and so it was it, it, amazing it, greens and pinks that it, night. It's amazing, right? So it's just incredible to see that they're not so, you know the aurora start kind of like you know it's kind of static, moving like a. Uh, like slow moving clouds, but then they go through this uh, um, uh, stage during the night called a sub storm. And what's happening is the magnetic tail of the earth is, um, is actually imparting energy into electrons. So electrons that come from the sun as well as from outer space get trapped in the mag uh, magnetic tail of the magnetic field of the earth. At some point that 
magnetic tail becomes that reservoir of electrons becomes unstable and the electrons are um, accelerated towards the magnetic poles. When they come through the uh, atmosphere all at once, you know, in a very short amount of time, you're pumping all these electrons, the aurora start uh, becoming that active and that dynamic like you see in that, uh, in that video. And that's when they start moving really, really fast into the, uh, you know, unaided eye. You can just see that motion that you see on the video. So it's beautiful to be able to have the technology to capture something that the eyes can see. And now I can tell people, yes, most of the time I'm showing time-lapse sequences, but take a look at how fast they can actually move. The, this and is... the colors as well. Yeah. And the colors as well, right? So our eyes... Um, have they're not they haven't evolved in, in a way to detect color when the light conditions are low at night the human eye is interested in seeing levels of brightness right um, not necessarily colors but as things become brighter then our the retina starts picking up more color that's exactly what happens uh, to the aurora they look like a muted green but as they become brighter then we can start picking up more color including those reds that you see in the video now so, it you don't just do photography of aurora as you mentioned you you've also captured here i'm bringing up um the it looks like a uh night sky rotation of the Milky Way over the canyon lands. And I, I love being able to see all of the planes moving through the sky and everything. You do a variety of different kinds of photography, of different things. Um, what, what has brought you the most pleasure to get to be able to just capture and share with the rest of the world? Uh, two things uh, come to mind. One, the Milky Way as seen from the Southern Hemisphere, yes. right? So uh, nothing like uh, being like in, in Chile, for example, in the Atacama Desert. Probably the, 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 the most beautiful night sky that I have ever seen is from, from the Atacama Desert, for example, where the uh, very large uh, telescope is located. Alma as well, yeah. uh, the, uh, the Alma Array. So, and, and to have the center of the galaxy, right? The galactic bulge right at the zenith. Yes. To, you know, just going right above you. That's an incredible, incredible view. So that's one. And then, um, and then of course, the auroras. Yes. And, and they're, they're, you know, and they're different in the sense that the Milky Way, you know what the Milky Way is going to do. Uh, the Milky Way is going to rise at a certain time right that we know uh, especially nowadays we have all these incredible astronomical apps you know in, on our phone so we know exactly uh what's where and what's you know what time is going to rise and everything and that way you can prepare your 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 photography you can be ready for it but it's a very predictive way right the only thing that could change is the weather you know yes. clouds might come by and so on sometimes they're interesting most of the time you you know, we hate clouds, right? In astronomy, we start to we try to stay away from them. But then the auroras are, although you can see some patterns, they're different every night. Yes. You know, they're different every night. You do see some east-west, you know, uh, uh, structures, and it, it's 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 nice to see how something starts to move in a certain way, and you know that a substorm is about to happen. So it's it's interesting. But they're interesting in, in different ways. If I have to add a third item, it would be to see lava flows, yes. you know, surface lava flows, right? So if you go to Hawaii, um, you know, and you get to see um, these surface lava flows, which, which again, I think it's incredible because what you're seeing is an island that is still forming, yes. right? And, and and more, you know, coastline is 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 added to the surface area so i say that those three things you know the milky way the auroras and lava flows are just incredible not only to to photograph but of course to witness that yeah uh, all the things i want to see all the things i want to see 
And thanks to your videos, I can see a lot of them. And it is that one degree of separation further than being there in person. But there is, as you pointed out, something cool in saying, a human I know took these images. Right. And, and then it becomes, it, because it's, then it not only becomes just about facts, yeah. but it's about experience. And then people, you see how people, is that, oh, wait a second, you were there? Oh, you took those pictures? Yeah. Then tell me about it. And it's not only, you know, it could be which technology did you use, right? Which camera, how did you, but it's also tell me about being there. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, I spent nine nights at the, uh, or I should say days at the, at the at, in Antarctica since it was during spring. So for nine days, I didn't see the night sky. I didn't see the sun setting. Um, so then I could be talking about the South Pole, the South Pole telescope, right, that we have over there uh, researching early formation of galaxies, right, in the early part of the, of the universe. But then it's like, oh, what does it entail to fly to Antarctica, then fly to the South Pole? Where did you stay? Tell me about the South Pole station. Yeah. So it not only becomes about, like I said, not only about science, science facts, but tell me about the process of making science. Tell me about the process of going through that experience and going there. And it becomes more, you know, anecdotal and more, more human than just a bullet list of, of interesting things, you know, interesting facts that you can share. And it, it, it's, it's incredible, very gratifying to see people's interest and engagement. And, and as science communicators who use technology as part of our communications, uh, we are among the lucky few who really do get to travel the entire world and among the unfortunate few who try and do it carrying objects that may cause eyebrows to be raised by TSA and their equivalents in other nations. Um, I know I have been detained for having an audio recorder with me that looked like a taser. Um, I no longer have that audio recorder. Uh, what, what are some <laughs> of the things that, that have happened to you over the years um, that are um, memorable and not actually uh, related to the gathering photons into your camera? So, well, TSA, yeah, I have brought interesting things, including you know, a device that you use in, in, in shops, you know, for, you know, grinding and metal and so on. But this was used to actually rotate the camera between exposures. Yeah. So you can, right. So you can have a time-lapse sequence and actually there's a very popular sequence that I shot in the, in the, uh, Cerro Paranal of the, of the, uh, VLT. So it's basically, you know, you see the night sky rotating, but at the, in the meantime, you know, the camera is actually rotating. Yeah. Nowadays, there are like off the shelf equipment that it's being designed specifically to do that. Yes. But 10 years ago, that didn't, you know, it was basically ingenious people, uh, including this gentleman in, 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 in California, who basically took, like I said, this equipment from a, from a shop, you know, shop equipment, which is really, really heavy. And he said, yeah. oh, then you put your camera and he may design his own controller that would, rotate the camera in between exposures and all of that. Well, I remember going to Chile and on the way there, people be like saying, what the heck is, is this? Because it's really, it's really, really heavy. Right. And then of course I have to bring hard drives and all, all this, you know, I have three cameras. And I remember at some point TSA said like, oh, please take all your electronics out, including all the hard drives. And I said, no, <laughs> I'd rather no. I rather <laughs> wait to be asked. If you ask me to take it out, I will. But if I voluntarily, before being asked, put everything that it's in an electronic in a tray, yes. <laughs> on a, on a tray I'm going to be spending a long time here. So I said, like, you know what? No, I, you know, if I ask, I, I'll politely say, like, yeah, of course, I'll take it out. Right. But I cannot have preemptively. Because I would be emptying the whole backpack, you know. Yeah. Um, going going to Canada, I was asked. I brought a drone. Oh, next time, you know, uh, take the drone out. And I said again, 
No, I return next time I wasn't asked. Of course, you're going to get different things in different places. So like if I'm asked to take it out, I'll, of course, I'll, 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 I'll comply. But I cannot <laughs> preemptively empty my backpack because, you know, this is going to be a long, a long yeah. process. It's so so right? I'm laughing so hard because in part, it's exactly the same strategy I take. The laptop comes out, the iPad yes. comes out. Everything else stays in until they ask. And they until always are like, can you please remove all electronic items? And it's just sort of like, what counts uh, as large? They haven't defined it. I can get away with this. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I've run into cases I, when I went to Austria recently. Um, I, I think I was carrying a bag of holding instead of a normal backpack because when everything came out, there, there's a certain point where the people behind you in line are like, why does this person have so much electronics? But then if you keep going, they're like, wow, what does she do? And they're impressed. And when you uh -huh. can cross that line from annoying the people behind you to having them ask, what do you do? This is cool. Um, yeah, apparently that's how much electronics I carry. And I suspect you've had similar experiences. Yes, yes. And, and all, almost everything, you know, the only thing not electronic are, you know, the lenses themselves, you know, even a camera is, yeah. is electronic. You know, it's interesting, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, they used to take the camera bodies and they would ask, remove the lens cap and they wanted to see through the through the viewfinder. I guess that's the way that they would prove this is actually a camera and nothing yeah. else. So they would say, remove the lens cap and they would look through the camera. It's it really, it's really interesting. Nowadays, nowadays I love that they basically they they um they they you know they have the test with the strip. Right. Yes. That they basically they're looking for, you know, for a first, you know, explosives. Right. Uh, 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 and they do that very quickly. Yes. And then they put it in the machine and they don't have to take things out. Right. So I'm like, yeah. And, you know, the best thing is, like you said, you know, you you smile, you answer their their questions and you like you said, sometimes you can engage them. Oh, what is it that you do? And yeah. you tell them about what you do and so on. And then you go. But it's like. Yeah, but I will take the laptop out, but everything else, if you ask, only if you ask me, because if there's, if there's a lot out there, you know, in that yes. backpack. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, the, the, don't the, the other interesting right. thing, the thing to, that happened in Chile is I went in and I had so much equipment, they wanted to make sure that I didn't have a business and I was selling an equipment in Chile, right? Because oh. you can go in, you sell it, you make a profit, right. then you leave the country and you don't declare anything, right? So basically it was kind of, I don't know, it's, I guess like a, like a statement in an affidavit where basically I'm saying this is for, uh, you know, for work and this is leaving the country. And, and then on your multiple, way, yeah. You right, and then on the way out. Bodies. Yes, exactly. So I had to make a list of, you know, it took a, a while with serial numbers. And then on the way out, they they want to make sure that yeah. those things are leaving the country. <laughs> oh, wow. I guess I'm lucky that I usually carry one of everything. Now, admittedly, it is one of everything, but uh, only one. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you want redundancy, right? What if, about if, if this fails? So yeah. it's, yeah, it's a challenge. And then, of course, the other challenge is I don't, check in you know the, right. the the equipment it has to come with me yes so my backpack is so dense and so heavy <laughs> because i'm carrying everything with me i'm not going to check it in it comes with me yeah that's that poses another challenge so yeah. so don't ever fly air austria I, I learned the hard way. They limit your carry-on to eight kilograms and then take it away from you and um my carry-on weighed 18 kilograms and they took it away from me and there was I nothing I could do. So. I know. It, there are some countries that are very strict about the, car the weight of the carry-on luggage and your backpack and that is a big challenge. Yes, it happens in Europe. Happened to me, I think, returning from, I think it was from New Zealand, either New Zealand or, or Australia. And they're like, no, this is too heavy. I'm, I'm so happy that here we can just go through and you have your <laughs> incredibly heavy 
uh, uh, backpack, but as long as it fits, you know, under the seat, right? Or if you have your carry-on that fits in the overhead compartment, that's fine. They're not so strict here about weight, but it is an issue. It is an issue. It's always a risk, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I've got nothing on that other than I apparently still have trauma over uh, being detained over my audio recorder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a taser. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a full, we're taking your passport away now. Go sit on that bench with four large men watching you. Um, mm -hmm. May that never, ever happen to you. Now, for, for all of the weirdness we deal with going through customs and immigration, we also get to go to some of the magnificent places in the most magnificent places in the world. So far, you've mentioned Antarctica, the Northern Territories of Canada, New Zealand. Of, of all the places you've gotten to go, what, what surprised you the most? Um, well, let's see. I think that I think New Zealand is really impressive impressive and it surprised me in the sense that it's like a it's like a continent you know compressed into <laughs> two islands meaning the landscapes vary so much you know you can go to uh, New Zealand and go to beautiful beaches and then you have tropical forests and you have snow-capped mountains and it's so different you know for a place um relatively small they have you know the, the 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 landscape is so uh so different that it, it's incredible so that you know it, like let's say you go to iceland i mean iceland is very very impressive but it's more homogeneous if you will you know more you go from one place you know it, it, the variations that you see are not as big as in as in new zealand so that was something surprising and that's why i have to you know have i have to go back i've been there twice always on the way to somewhere else one was a conference in australia the other one was on the way to antarctica and and coming back from antarctica but i have to go to new zealand just to explore new zealand because i think it's absolutely beautiful yeah it's you're naming the places on my bucket list i've i've been yeah. to to wellington but uh I want to see more and Iceland still needs to happen. Now, with with our our current world, we're we're facing this fascinating tug of war for astronomy between greater industrialization, cities growing, expansion of people into new places, and a understanding of how important it is to uh, conserve electrons to use less electricity to be responsible and and this means that we we have a fascinating tug of war in the area of um light pollution what are are you seeing in terms of impact of of both energy conservation efforts, the proliferation of LEDs which are nasty little beasts for light pollution um how are you seeing the world's skies change now that you've been doing this for more than a decade? Uh, well, definitely, uh, definitely, I can see you know the change. For example, in, in my you know native country in Puerto Rico, um, and you know you just see basically the the night sky you know dis disappearing. Um, in other places, I've seen some programs being implemented. Actually, the uh, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of, of, of Canada, where yeah. I go twice. Uh, by the way, I go I, I go there t twice because although I'm not producing um, films now, I'm actually leading tours, okay. which is yet another project another science communication project because now I can bring people to, to Yellowknife and I can teach them about the Northern Lights and how to photograph the Northern Lights. So I do that every, every September and every, every March. So I have been in meetings with the, um, been honored that the city of Yellowknife has invited me to discuss this problem of, of uh, light pollution, because of course they depend on it. Not only it's a 
beautiful thing for the residents of Yellowknife to enjoy, but their, you know, their economy depends on all, all the tourists coming to see the lights. And they are actually implementing uh, uh, ways to use, you know, artificial lighting in, in a more efficient way, right? And yeah, it, it's very sad about LEDs because it's such a, it's such a good technology if used well. Yes. Right. And then the sad thing is that number one, it, it's interesting how the, 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 the benefit becomes like, you know, the enemy and, and right. It becomes, and so they are very efficient, energy efficient. So what do people do? Oh, let's crank them up because we're saving so much, you know, energy anyway. Right. So let's make things brighter. And you drive through cities where not only, are they wasting energy anyway? Uh, the energy is going upward instead of downward. Yeah. But I think it becomes a hazard for the driver. There is some, right? Some of these signs, road signs, are so bright yeah. that they're not only a distraction, but I think they, they're just, they're actually quite dangerous. And then it's all about common sense. If you're going to put an LED screen, then why don't you use white text? on a black background instead of black text on a white background right. that will blind you, right? So it's not only an eyesore, it's so many bad things. It's an eyesore. I think they're dangerous. It's um, uh, energy uh, inefficient. So I guess it's all, it's all about education, right? We go back yeah. to what we do and it's telling, you know, the city officials about, how they're wasting energy, how they're destroying the night, uh, the night sky. And that's why science education is so important because we want government officials to be science attentive people, right? Right. <laughs> we need them to understand, you know, science because if they don't do, then it's it's problems. So it, it's actually good for a society that everybody is um science attentive and 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 understand the basics of science right yes, <laughs> it's not that yes. they become that they become experts but that they become you know science attentive people so then as, as a society we can we can make better decisions now you've you've done a number of things over the past several years what what are the things you're working on tying up right now that we can look forward to seeing in the coming months or year um well let's see in the in the coming months i don't know if you if you have people in the northern indiana area actually I have a concert i'm presenting pictures at an exhibition with in north manchester indiana with the Manchester uh, University Symphony Orchestra. And if you go, if they go to kv265.org, they can see a list of upcoming upcoming concerts. So that's always happening. Um, but in terms of production and show production, um, I, I was so fascinated um, by the lunar tides when I photographed them for uh, this, you know, third science and symphony film called Moonrise. That um, that we decided to make a film just about the lunar tides. So I just returned from uh, Nova Scotia, where I was um, photographing, taking time lapse uh, photography of the of the tides, as well as aerial photography of these places at low tide and high tide. And that's going to be part of um, a ten minute uh, film with music, again, commissioned specifically for this project by this Canadian composer, John Estacio. So that will take a little while because I have to, that would basically is gonna rely mostly on my photography. So that means multiple trips to, you know, photograph them, get a lot of footage. And like I said, then condense that to, to 10 minutes. So, so but it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to be standing it, you know, at some of these places along the Bay of Fundy, where the landscape in six hours mm -hmm. changes tremendously, tremendously, yes. uh, because the uh, the 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 water, depending on the on the profile of you know the uh, the the seafloor, in this case, you know the the bottom of of the bay itself, if it's very shallow, 
a very shallow profile, that means that the tide will recede for, you know, for, for miles. So the landscape changes tremendously. If it's a ver very vertical uh, profile, that means that the water, like I said, can drop almost, you know, 50 feet in six hours and look completely different. And, and that happens twice a day. And, and I really encourage any of you looking for someplace quiet and beautiful to go on vacation. Uh, the, the Bay of Fundy, there's, there's places where the entire uh, river may not be quite the right word. It will empty out and look like the landscape of Mars and then fill back up and be an Absolutely. active river. Exactly. And, and the tidal bore causes rivers and streams to run backwards periodically. Yes. Yeah, they go, they go upstream. Right, right. And, uh, and actually, uh, very good observation about the Martian landscape, because you know that how we see all these uh, images from from the orbiter, right? Yeah. Uh, of, you know, past evidence of, of you know, of water on, on Mars. And you, you see that exactly when the water recedes, yeah. you get to see that right here because it's, you know, it's kind of like a dry bed, but it's just that it's dry for, you know, less than six hours right. and then it gets, you know, but again, but yes, it, it really, it really resembles some of these places resemble the Martian landscape. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is, it's interesting, right? The, the people who study planetary, um, uh, you know, do planetary sciences, how, of course, if you're studying another world, what well, better than compare it to what you see on Earth? So they are, you know, geologists who now have applied that knowledge to geology on, in, you know, in other worlds. And it's really, really interesting to make the comparisons and say like, yeah, there was definitely water here on, on, on Mars because it actually is just exactly how uh, places where there was water on Earth looked like. So... And it's interesting to compare the, these worlds. Yeah, it's comparative plant planetology. Planetology, is, exactly. Is exactly. is always amazing. Now yeah. it, we are somehow almost out of time. This this hour has flown past. And the the final question I want to ask you is, what would you say to someone who is considering this kind of what is called a non-traditional career where here you are a PhD astronomer working with composers and traveling mm -hmm. the world taking photography how would you tell them that they should well get started if they want to have their own creative interdisciplinary journey like yours so I would say that you know uh, Suggestion number one is don't abandon what you're passionate about. And it's so sad to talk to adults that say, when I was a kid, I used to love doing this, right? And it could be, it could be dance, it could be drawing, it could be a music, musical instrument. Hey, it could be even, even sports. Yeah. And it's like I said, it, it's sad that that people they just focus on one thing. They're trying to become, you know, a professional in a particular career and everything else is out the window, yeah. right? So I was fortunate enough and I always say that, you know, this was not by design. It was that I guess I never abandoned those things. And then I was lucky enough to see the connections and how, how, how I could bring those things into into the fold right and combine them professionally um so i was very fortunate to do that to be able to 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 go through that you know career path so now when i talk to kids like i said i i tell them not to abandon abandon those passions and find ways where they can combine that with what they are you know studying you know academically um and I think the bottom line is that if you don't abandon those things and you turn what you're really passionate about into a career, you're going to be a happier individual because then you will blur the lines between play and work. So, and when I travel, I mean, it's really hard for me to distinguish between vacation and work. Yeah. Because, right, because when I'm working out in the field, 
well, these are things that I love and these are things that I would be doing as a hobby yeah. somehow otherwise, but I'm doing them for work. And when I go on vacation, oftentimes, you know, I'm doing photography um, and hey, maybe I'm not, you know, particularly producing a film at that moment, but maybe I'm scouting for a, for a, for a, for a future trip, right? Or I can be taking photographs that will, like I said, at the very least end up in the lectures. So I have blurred the lines between, you know, play and, and, and work. So I think that people, you know, society members would be happier and we would have a happier society if people really loved what they, what they, what they do in life, right? What they do to get, to get, you know, foot on the table. And, um, and, and it's sad and it's, I'm not a fan of the phrase, hey, maybe I'm fortunate enough not to use that phrase, but thank God is Friday. <laughs> yes, it, yes. Right? Because listen, of course the weekend is great and you can spend time with your family and do the things that you love. But if your goal in life <laughs> is to reach Friday, right? And then on yeah. Monday, you are like, you know, it's it's a, it's a dreadful day. Then there's there's something wrong. You know, there's something wrong. And um, that means that you're not doing what you're, you know, maybe what you should be uh, doing. And like I said, you know, I don't want to be, it's not harsh criticism because, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to combine all these things. Yeah. But maybe this is what, People should do, especially young people, mm -hmm. they should do, I should find a job. So let me work, start working on early, trying to define that career path in such a way that 10 years from now, I'll be doing something I really love. And yes, I'll be happy that during the weekend, I'll be able to spend more time with my family. But it's not that I'll be dreading that it's Monday and my goal in life is to reach to Friday because everything else is bring some happiness. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I, I think the goal for Saturday is to be able to sleep as long as I want, but to always enjoy getting to go to work, just occasionally exactly. wanting to sleep many more hours. Right. Um, this this has been a fabulous conversation. And and I hope to have you back when when you come out with Absolutely. your next amazing thing. And and thank you so much for joining us and everyone out there you have the links go check out jose's artwork and film and and the music that has been composed to go along with this uh, absolutely and we have you know covered many many things but uh if you want to cover some of these things in detail we can do that next time and of course your viewers if they have suggestions of like you know what next time they should chat about this subject in particular you know, they should feel free to do so. And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll coordinate. Sound, sounds fabulous. So thank, so you, thank, thank you, Jose. Thank you, everyone out in the audience. This has been Learning Space, a production of CosmoQuest. And I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And we will be back, not next week. We're taking next week off. We will be back the first Thursday in November. And, um, Give us a follow. Follows are free. And um, wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, and get outside and look up. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jose. Thank you.